All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Welcome to today's policy session of the Phoenix City Council for June 24th, 2014. Uh, we have a couple of uh, pretty meaty items on our uh, agenda, so I'm gonna ask that we hold council comments until the end of the meeting, because I think a couple of council members uh, have, to, have to leave at a certain time. I wanna make sure we get to all the business of the meeting before uh, that occurs. Um, and so we'll hold council information and follow-up requests for now. The vice mayor is uh, nearby, uh, so when he gets back, I'll ask him if do we have a consent agenda. Do you know? Do we have a consent agenda? <laughs> there is no consent agenda for today. Do we have an executive session call for today? Mayor, in accordance with the properly noticed, uh, noticed and agenda, in accordance with the properly posted notice and agenda, I move that the City Council, pursuant to Arizona Revised Statute Section 38-431.02.A, meet in executive session on Tuesday, September 9th, 2014, at 1 p.m. in the East Conference Room, 12th floor of the Phoenix City Hall, 200 West Washington Street, Phoenix, Arizona. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Uh, I believe there are, oh, Mr. City Manager, are there any reports or updates uh, for yourself today? No, Mayor, uh, recognizing the time, I would suggest we recognize our employees and then get right to it. Item number two on the agenda is employee service recognition announcements. I do believe that we have some, looks like we have some great family members here to support our city employees as well. Uh, who on the council has a city employee recognition? Councilman Gates. Thank you, Mayor. All right, we have an award to Lisa Esquivel for 25 years. She began her career with the City of Phoenix on March 29, 1989, as a personnel uh, aide in the Human Resources Department. She has received several promotions during her career. She was promoted to Personnel Analyst 1 in June 1990, to Personnel Analyst 2 in October 1993, to Personnel Officer 1 in June 1999, to personnel supervisor in December 2001 and to deputy human resources director in September 2007. In February of 2014, Lisa transferred to the Human Services Department as a deputy director, which is the position she holds today. Lisa is a certified professional in human resources and has served as a past president of the Arizona chapter of the International Public Management Association of Human Resources. Congratulations to Lisa Esquivel for 25 years of excellent service to the city of Phoenix. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and it's my honor to uh, recognize Elizabeth Libby Bissa. Libby began her career with the City of Phoenix on May 14, 1984 as a fire communication operator with the fire department. She was promoted on February 5, 1990 to fire communications supervisor. On July 26, 1999, Libby was promoted to facility service coordinator in the public works department. She was promoted on July 23, 2001 to management assistant in the city manager's office. Libby's position was consolidated and she came to Human Services Department on July 12, 2010 as a management assistant too. She received a promotion on December 3, 2012 to management assistant three, the position she holds today. I can't believe you've been here 30 years. You don't look 30 years old. <laughs> Congratulations to Libby on her excellent, outstanding service. Emmett Boyd began his career with the city, with the city in October 1981 as a part-time recreation leader. Over the years, he has received several promotions to full-time recreation coordinator one in April 1989, to recreation coordinator two in 1990, and to recreation coordinator three in 1999. The position he holds today, serving as a park manager for the Rio Salado Habitat Restoration Area. During his career, Emmett has received numerous awards, including four city managers' excellent awards for programs and departmental partnerships, recognition from former District 8 Councilman Michael Johnson, recognition from Radio Campesina 
for the Fiesta Patria celebration at Barrios Unidos Park and notes of gratitude from Senator John McCain and Arizona Representative David Schweiker. In addition, he received recogni recognition from the Arizona Parks and Recreation Association for the Lifeguard Community Outreach and Recruitment Program. Emmett currently serves as the city's liaison and chairman for the annual Martin Luther King Jr. celebration held at Hans Park. Of his many accomplishments, the one that stands out the most for him is serving on the Parks Department Lifeguard Task Force, which engages non-traditional inner city young people in a career choice that in many cases continued for decades. Uh, congratulations to Emmett Boyd for 25 years of excellent service to the city of Phoenix. Thank you. Hey, Mayor. Mayor, I'd like to say a comment about Emmett. Emmett's been really a good mentor for a lot of the kids in South Phoenix. Um, when I was growing up, everybody used to talk about all the fun trips that they used to take um, back in. Um, he would take kids from South Phoenix up to the snow and just basically doing all kinds of things that kids would never have the opportunity of doing. So, Emmett, I just really want to thank you for being that mentor and sometimes for being that parent, that, that father that many of those kids never had. So thank you, Emmett, for everything you do for the kids, especially the kids in South Phoenix and District 8 and District 7. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And I get the pleasure of uh, introducing David Orney. David began his career with the City of Phoenix in April 1989 as a clerk, clerk one in the Municipal Court Clerk's Division post-court assistance. Now that was a long one. <laughs> In 1991, he, promoted to pr he was promoted to police communications operator in the police department. And in January 1999, David was assigned as a training assistant in communication, responsible for hiring and training of new employees, as well as job recruitment and community education for 911 and dispatch. In January 2001, David was promoted to the police communications supervisor, the position he holds today. He is currently assigned to the swing shift, oversees the day-to-day -day operations of the emergency 911 dispatch center, and is responsible for more than 25 employees during a shift. During his career, David has received several accommodations for, for his display of professionalism with employees as well as the citizens of Phoenix and he has come, that he has come into contact with. He also received several recommendations for his work on public education of the 911 system for children and adults. David is currently pursuing a bachelor's degree from Arizona State University and enjoys spending quality time with his family and his friends. Congratulations <coughs> to David for 25 years of excellent service to the city of Phoenix. Thanks again to our outstanding city employees for their excellent service to the people of our community. Uh, next on the agenda is going to be item number three. Item number three is uh, street transportation initiatives and it's broken down into a couple parts. First, uh, part A will be a discussion of the complete streets ordinances that are proposed uh, and that is an action item for uh, today. Uh, 3B will be a downtown Phoenix comprehensive transportation study results and recommendations and I believe that is also an action item. So I think that discussion, Mr. City Manager, will be led by Milton Dahoney, our Assistant City Manager. Good to see you. Thank you, Mayor, members of Council. I'm joined this afternoon by Ray Davalina, the Acting Streets, Acting Director for Streets Transportation, Mark Melnichenko, Special Projects Administrator, and John Ford with Complete Streets. So uh, with that, we'll get right into the presentation. Thank you, Milton. Uh, Mayor and, and uh, City Council members, uh, we have a short video uh, with regards to the presentation. Today, the Street Transportation Department is presenting recommendations to the City Council on two ordinances that would support the City's efforts to develop complete streets, meaning roadways that are safe, comfortable for, and accessible to all users. This presentation provides more information on the concept of complete streets and how the related ordinances were developed. 
Streets are a vital element of every community. Whether arterial or local, well-designed streets can do more than move traffic and people. With additional planning, communities can complete their streets, building road networks that are safer, more livable, and welcoming to everyone. Complete streets are also part of a balanced street network that supports all types of transportation, including walking, biking, driving, and using public transit. Most importantly, complete streets are context sensitive, meaning that they are developed to meet the needs of their particular communities. As such, complete streets policies can provide the foundation for all phases of transportation planning and improvements. Complete streets come with many related benefits, including increased economic development, better transportation options for residents, greater user safety, and environmental improvements. Complete streets also help build a healthy community by supporting more active lifestyles. In particular, the health and economic benefits of complete streets are gaining recognition nationally as such policies are being supported by the federal government through their necessary inclusion in federal grant applications. Successful complete streets hinge on a strong transit system, clear land use policies, community acceptance, and other factors. Citywide coordination is also key to an effective complete streets policy as it encompasses both new and existing streets and provides guidance on both city and developer-led projects. Phoenix's Complete Streets ordinances were developed through the efforts of the Phoenix Complete Streets Working Group, a community-led committee comprised of diverse stakeholders. Working Group members helped to develop the core elements of Phoenix's Complete Streets concept. Members also worked with staff to share information throughout the community, including to all 15 village planning committees, the city's development advisory board, the planning commission, and the city council transportation and infrastructure subcommittee. Guiding principles for the Complete Streets initiative were unanimously recommended by all groups and endorsed by numerous others. The ordinances presented today were drafted after initial input from the Transportation and Infrastructure Subcommittee and further consultation with the City's Law Department and the Working Group. The result are two ordinances, one establishing a set of guiding principles for Complete Streets projects and a second creating a City Complete Streets Advisory Board. Once established, the Advisory Board would work to develop a citywide draft Complete Streets policy and related standards based on the guiding principles. Approval of these ordinances would make Phoenix the first city in the Valley to adopt a Complete Streets Ordinance. Ordinance S establishes the guiding principles for Phoenix's Complete Streets. The principles call for street design and construction to support walking, bicycling and transit use, as well as ease of traffic flow, that construction projects will actively look for ways to make streets safer, and that the city will work with all entities, including city departments and outside organizations, to look for opportunities to build or improve streets so that they are complete and part of all relevant documents and procedures. Ordinance G would create the Complete Streets Advisory Board, consisting of 11 voting members and 8 non-voting members from various city departments. The board would prepare a Complete Streets Design Manual, refine the set of draft performance measures developed by the Complete Streets Working Group to measure implementation success, and provide guidance on prioritizing capital improvement program projects and recommendations on items concerning Complete Streets to the City Council. This concludes the presentation on this first phase of the Complete Streets Initiative. Staff recommends conceptual approval of the Complete Streets Ordinances, which outline the Complete Streets Guiding Principles and establishes the Complete Streets Advisory Board to be formally adopted at the July 2, 2014 formal meeting. This item was unanimously recommended for approval by the Downtown Aviation and Redevelopment Subcommittee at its June 4, 2014 meeting. All right, uh, thank you very much. I, there's more presentation uh, as well, I'm assuming. Although that is the first time I heard Matthew as the voice of God. <laughs> Tell me he, did a great, he did great work on that, that was excellent. The following is the uh, Downtown Transportation Study. Um. 
Today, the Street Transportation Department is presenting recommendations to the City Council on changes to Phoenix's downtown street and transportation system. These recommendations grew out of the Downtown Phoenix Comprehensive Transportation Study, a joint project between the City of Phoenix and the Maricopa Association of Governments. The study brought together numerous stakeholders, including residents, businesses, city departments, and other groups to provide a new vision and multi-year plan for downtown. The project's primary purpose is to improve how visitors and residents get around downtown. Better mobility and access in turn support area businesses, residents, and downtown development. To this end, the city, contracting with the firm Wilson & Company, evaluated current street usage patterns, potential changes to driving habits, pedestrian behavior, and transit service, including bus and light rail, to generate a set of recommendations for near, mid, and long-term improvements to downtown infrastructure. Starting in July 2013, the city conducted an extensive public input process with stakeholder focus groups, community open houses, and meetings with residents and downtown organizations, Additionally, staff work to capitalize on current city plans and initiatives to craft the final recommendations. Building on the department's complete streets policy and draft bicycle master plan, as well as citywide planning efforts such as reinvent Phoenix and plan Phoenix. Altogether, more than 40 meetings were held with hundreds of residents providing feedback and helping develop the study recommendations. This graphic depicts the transit system in the downtown area. Currently, Washington and Jefferson Streets and First and Central Avenues carry growing regional commuter car traffic, as well as local buses and light rail. The corridor will also be home to future additional light rail lines. To address the impact that these future light rail lines, I-10 West and South Central Phoenix, will have on overall mobility, the study examined what potential modifications could be made to support all users of the city's right-of-way, including transit passengers, pedestrians, and bicyclists. The result of this work was the development of three phased transportation recommendations encompassing improvements that could be made in the short term, defined as immediately to within five years, mid-term, defined as between 6 and 10 years, and in the long term, which would be 11 or more years. Phase 1 centers on the transition of 3rd and 5th avenues and 3rd and 5th streets from one-way to two-way thoroughfares. In addition, specific bicycle connections to downtown would also be added. 3rd Street would become a bicycle corridor into and out of downtown and Washington and Jefferson Street bike lanes would be connected between 7th Avenue and 7th Street to provide a continuous throughway. These improvements will help area circulation, business access, and increase residents' transportation options. Phase 2 centers on improvements to streetscape and infrastructure on the outer boundaries of downtown, including along 7th Avenue and 7th Street. These improvements help to create better connectivity for pedestrians and will begin adding transit, bicycle, and pedestrian amenities along Central Avenue between Van Buren and Washington Streets. In addition, 3rd Street south of Jefferson will become a two-way road, allowing for better connections to ASU's downtown campus to the south and convenient access for area residents and businesses in the warehouse district. These changes were developed with input from downtown stakeholders, including the Phoenix Suns and Arizona Diamondbacks, to ensure needed access to their venues. Due to additional transit service planned in future years, it was imperative that the project team also plan for travel through the center of downtown. To meet that need, in Phase 3, Central Avenue would become a limited access street for cars, with an added emphasis on other modes of transportation. The east side of Central Avenue would include improved bus passenger facilities, wider sidewalks, and potential areas for business activity. In turn, 1st Street, 7th Street, and 7th Avenue would serve as alternate routes for downtown drivers. Additionally, 
by changing one-way roads to two-way streets in downtown, improved circulation and greater land use density would allow for a neighborhood circulator transit route to be added to help connect residents to high activity areas and light rail. Finally, the project team also evaluated potential changes to the Downtown Events Management Plan or Sunburst Plan. Three specific recommendations were suggested from the study and would be examined in greater detail as part of Phase 2, specifically during sporting events. First, a portion of 3rd Street would be closed during events to help maintain pedestrian safety. Second, to increase westbound access to downtown during events, a through lane on Washington Street would be kept open. Third, to ensure safe access for area residents at the summit and future residential complexes near Chase Field and U.S. Airways Center, 3rd Street would be modified to provide one northbound lane to Jackson Street from Lincoln Street and two lanes southbound to Lincoln south of Jackson Street. This concludes today's presentation on the Downtown Phoenix Comprehensive Transportation Study. Staff requests that the City Council recommend moving forward with more detailed analysis of the strategies outlined in the Downtown Phoenix Comprehensive Transportation Study and to work towards securing project funding. This item was unanimously recommended for approval by the Downtown Aviation and Redevelopment Subcommittee at its June 4, 2014 meeting. Mayor, members of council, admittedly the devil is always in the details, but what is happening this afternoon is the administration is trying to send a signal with your support that Phoenix is a city that is forward looking, Phoenix is a city that is uh, dedicated to coordinating its systems. We are planning in an inclusive manner with our stakeholders. We are promoting the notion of urban walkability. We are planning for our major arteries and trying to lay out a platform whereby we have strong interaction between all of the various elements that use our streets, that use our downtown core, and use our neighborhoods. Uh, we have three people here to answer your questions, but in the end, we are asking for support of the recommendation in front of you. Thank you very much. Is there additional presentation? All right, <clears throat> excellent. So we had the, uh, the video, uh, and then we had the additional comments. I think the best way to do it is kind of break this into two parts. I think we should first, I'm um, gonna take some public testimony now. I'll take, I'll take public testimony on the complete streets uh, proposal uh, first and then likely take a vote on that, or take comments from the council and then take a vote on that, and then we'll move on to the downtown transportation uh, study and recommendations uh, thereafter. So now I'll move to uh, comments on 3A, uh, Complete Streets uh, proposal. Teresa Bryce from LISC, did you wanna provide testimony? Up to two minutes, followed by David Dubay, I hope I pronounced that correctly, up to two minutes, followed by Serena Unrein, I kinda, I blew that one, I'm sure, but please, uh, you'll, you'll follow up, thank you. Teresa, good to see you. Come here. My name is Teresa Bryce. I'm with Local Initiative Support Corporation. I live in downtown Phoenix at 650 North 2nd Avenue. I'm here today to talk about the economic impact of complete streets. You heard a little bit about that in the presentation, but I think we can characterize the economic impact of complete streets in these ways. First of all, in the individual, at the individual level. When we have complete streets, we give more mobility options to the residents of Phoenix, which means that we provide comfortable ways to walk someplace, safe ways to use a bicycle to get to, to destinations, as well as to provide for cars and buses and trains. When you look at those opportunities, that means that people can, if they are willing and if they are uh, interested in, give up a car for their use. And that saves approximately $9,000 per year for a family if they, have to, if they don't have to rely on more than one automobile. People will say that in a city like Phoenix that is so auto-centric, many people would not do that. It's too hot to walk. But I'm here to tell you that I've done it. I live downtown. I have a 12-minute walk from door to door from my office to my apartment, and it's not bad. You take a, an umbrella, you take some water, um, and it's a very comfortable walk um, at, at any time of the year. So it is something that residents have expressed an interest in, and we know that there will be um, additional disposable income if complete streets make it possible for people to give up even one vehicle if they so desire. 
The next Im economic impact is with uh, respect to individual houses, houses and neighborhoods. We know that a study of 15 real estate markets indicated that there um, are significant increases in property values, as much as increased home values from $700 to $3,000 per housing unit when complete streets are implemented in a neighborhood. So that's a significant increase in property values. Um, in, in our uh, economic situation with the property values that we've had here, having an increase in property values is something I think that we would all like to see in terms of the economic impact of complete streets. Thank you very much. My last point was about um, pri attracting private investment, but I'll respect the time restraint. Tracy, thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Oh, Captain, please go ahead. Go ahead. Quick comment, too. I think what you'll find, too, is that this literally is leading in a direction where the market is going. Individuals are looking for multimodal opportunities in any community, and that's what this plan is doing. It's putting in place. I want to thank you and everybody else that's been working on this. Uh, you've done an incredible amount of work on it. But really, that is where the, the future is, and what you're seeing is the city of Phoenix adapting and changing to what the, the, the needs are and the demands are in the public, too. So thanks for your work on it. Thank you, Council Member. I have a question as well. Please, uh, Council Member. Could you tell us about the financial institution's interest in investing in projects that do transit-oriented development and complete streets? Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, we've seen that um, investing, pri public investment in complete streets is actually an incentive to private investment. In one community alone, w with a $10.6 million public investment, it attracted over $125 million in private investment, a 26% increase in sales tax revenue, and 800 new jobs. So I think that as we redesign our neighborhoods, um, to attract the new demand that we're seeing uh, for walkability and more mobility um, besides the automobile, we'll see an increase in private investments that are attracted to this new type of community design, neighborhood design. Other questions for Teresa? Thank you for coming. Biking and biking. And, and biking, absolutely. All right, David Dubay. And then Serena followed by Mike Carstens. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, members of the council, thank you for this opportunity. My name is David Dubay. I'm a public health policy consultant with the Maricopa County Department of Public Health and a 14-year resident of District 3. I invited the Transportation Infrastructure Subcommittee a couple of weeks ago to just ask a simple question or answer the simple question, am I healthy? It seems like a simple question, but the answer will be less on the quality of your health care than on the quality of your community. And in this sense, the definition of public health is what we collectively do to assure the conditions in which people can be healthy, exercise choice, and personal responsibility. So you have an opportunity here to practice really good public health. Complete streets is a key public health goal. Um, when you see people walking, when you see people biking, uh, it is an indicator of a very healthy neighborhood, of a very healthy community. Those people are shopping local, they're building community, building social cohesion, and also getting their physical op op um, activity for that. So the Maricopa County Department of Public Health has been working uh, with the Phoenix Complete Streets Working Group and staff. We very much support any opportunity to promote active transit, bicycling, and pedestrian activity, and urge your support of the two ordinances. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dubay, for uh, coming down and providing testimony. Serena, you're next, followed by Mike Carstens. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor Stanton and members of the council. My name is Serena Unrein, and I work for the Arizona Public Interest Research Group, Arizona PERG, and I'm also a resident of Phoenix at 208 East Oregon Avenue. I'm here to speak in support of the two Complete Streets ordinances that are before you today. I've been a member of the Phoenix Complete Streets Working Group for the past couple of years and have worked very closely with members of the Street Transportation Department, and I'd like to thank them for all of their hard work on these ordinances and the extraordinary amount of time and energy they've put into the ordinances that are before you today. These ordinances are the right thing to do for the city of Phoenix and for residents because of the changing transportation trends that we are seeing here in Arizona that are much like the trends that we're seeing all across the country. 
for the first time in two generations, there is a dramatic shift in how people are choosing to get around. People are increasingly looking toward transit, walking, and biking for how they would like to get around. And complete streets will help to make Phoenix, as Councilman DeCicio said, economically competitive, and this is where the market is headed. And it's, it's clear that this evidence uh, that, the, that these transportation trends are playing out in Arizona just the way they are all across the country. While people are driving less, people are using transportation, public transportation in increased numbers, and they're looking to be able to walk and bike to work, to school, and for fun. Young people in particular are driving less and using transportation options more. Since today's young people are tomorrow's main users of our transportation system, and since infrastructure including roads, light rail, bike lanes, sidewalks can last for decades, it's essential that we start using our scarce transportation dollars to build and invest in the transportation system that the millennial generation and future Phoenicians really are looking to use. Complete streets will help to provide these kind of options and the city and streets department should be providing the infrastructure uh, and staffing for complete streets that the trends are pointing towards. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for providing any questions for Serena. How are we doing on our checkbook budgeting? Much better. Thank you thank for you. launching right, that good. transparency that. site. Yeah, so thank you. I appreciate that. Different issue, but important one too. All right. Um, next speaker will be uh, Mike Carson from AARP. Thank you, Mayor Stanton, members of the council. <clears throat> I'm a uh, volunteer uh, advocate uh, on behalf of AARP and its 400,000 members in this Phoenix area. As you, as you probably suspect, many of those members are not able to drive and dependent on their own uh, physical abilities to, uh, m to get around neighborhoods, to be able to walk, to ride a bike, to go on a three-wheel uh, cart, to engage with the neighborhood uh, to g supply their own daily needs and to uh, socialize and to, to uh, be a part of the community. Uh, walkable neighborhoods are an essential part of these complete, this complete street uh, program. Uh, the uh, program itself is an extension of AARP's uh, efforts for independent living for uh, the elderly, uh, aging in place uh, in the neighborhood where they can uh, find that mobility and uh, 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 aging in place and uh, uh, there's a third thing, <laughs> senior moment, excuse me. <laughs> uh, there, the, uh, and the complete streets is not only for, for the elderly. It is for children who bike to school. It is for uh, adults who can get, who become, have a more active and healthful uh, 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 life in the community and, uh, and, and, the, uh, and it adds to the sustainability of the community by the engagement of people one with the other in the neighborhood. Uh, please support uh, Complete Streets. Thank you very much, you. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Carson, for coming down. Appreciate your testimony very much. Uh, Next speaker will be uh, Eric Emmert, representing the Arizona Diamondbacks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Eric Emmert, representing the Arizona Diamondbacks with Norm Policy Group. Uh, for the record, we are supportive of the changes to the downtown transportation study uh, as they came out of the subcommittee. Um, addressed issues dealing with the, uh, the sevens, both 7th Street and 7th Avenue. Eric, real yeah. quick, I apologize. So uh, I, I <coughs> split up the items. So we're talking about the, the complete streets policy first, and then we're going to have a separate discussion of uh, 3B, which is the uh, downtown transportation study. I, and your card it says both 3A and 3B. I don't know if you had any testimony particularly on the issue of uh, the complete streets policy that's uh, being proposed before the council. Mr. Mayor, I will reserve my comments for later. Appreciate it. So I'll, I'll hold you and put you in the, uh, the 3B pile, if you will. Mr. Kreider, Dave Kreider, do you have any comments on 3A, or do you want to wait for 3B? Sylvia, are you here? Did you want to talk on, on the complete streets policy as well? Come on down. Good, af 
afternoon. My good afternoon. My name is Sylvia Yerusha. I work downtown and I live in District Six, Forty uh, Second Street. Um, and I'm here as a member of the uh, Complete Streets Working Group. I s have been working with them. I really thank the uh, staff of the city. Um, they really helped us with uh, understanding a lot of the concepts and it was a, a very productive uh, relationship for us to work together and come up with the ordinance. Um, I'm also involved because I'm a lender. I have uh, lent a, a lot of um, money for housing along the, uh, the rail in this, uh, within the city, so I wanted to make sure that those, all the uh, housing that we have done has been very successful and people do look forward to the connectivity that the new housing projects provide. So I think that that was very important. And also because I'm a Latina, and we have one of the highest incidences of high blood pressure and diabetes and walking is the healthiest things that we can do and the cheapest thing that we can do uh, to encourage our community to get healthier. So I think that those are very important things. And so I urge you to consider this and, and approve it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your um, uh, testimony. Uh, Haley Tilden Ritter, did you want to speak, uh, provide testimony on 3A? Thank you so much. Come on down. Followed by Suzanne Feaster. Mayor and members of City Council, thank you so much, first of all, for coming this far and having the Streets and Transportation Infrastructure Subcommittee approve this message. Um, <laughs> I'm very excited to see this unfold as we move forward in uh, future for future generations of Arizonans to travel by uh, by bicycle and by foot. It's an important step forward for all of us. So thank you so much for supporting us this far, and I look forward to um, I look forward to seeing more improvements in Phoenix. I thank you so much for everything you've done so far, and um, thank you very much. Thank you, Haley, very much for your testimony. I appreciate you coming down. I know you want to speak on 3B as, um, uh, as well. Suzanne Feaster is next. And then, uh, Ralph, did you want to speak on 3A or, or 3B or, or just 3B? Okay, perfect, okay. Suzanne, thank good you, to Mayor see you. Thank you, Mayor and Councilman. I'm Suzanne Feaster. I'm President and CEO of St. Luke's Health Initiatives, and I am a Phoenix resident. St. Luke's Health Initiatives has been deeply involved in the development of the Complete Streets Ordinance. John Ford, my colleague, has served on the working group with another one of my colleagues, C.J. Hager. And we, have, we just want to let you know that we stand ready and committed to not only helping this far, but also helping with the implementation, because that is a great deal of activity that will uh, occur after, if you take this vote. We really are appreciative of all the work. We're supportive of the advisory group having a very interdisciplinary uh, group among uh, city staff. We think that will be helpful. We have also been working on reInvent Phoenix and Phoenix Renews. And so all of those efforts that the city has had underway, I believe will be integrated into this work that is done, uh, launched through the Complete Streets. Over 600 municipalities in the United States have adopted ordinances such as this. So it is not on the bleeding edge. It really is something that uh, Phoenix is due and is time to take its place, rightful place, in looking at the economic vibrancy. So I would encourage you to support this uh, ordinance going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Suzanne, for uh, your leadership on this issue and so many others and St. Louis Health Initiative. I have a card here not wishing to speak from our friend Jim McPherson, uh, who's in favor of the proposed Complete Streets policy. And he marks on the card that the hat that he is wearing today is the Evans Churchill Neighborhood Downtown Voices Coalition and the Sustainable uh, Communities uh, Collaboration as well. Thank you, Jim, for your, uh, for your input on this item. I have no more cards on 3A. I apologize, I have Vincent Lopez also in favor, not wishing to speak, thank you for uh, your input, and then uh, Kenneth Steele in favor, not wishing to speak. Um, so those are all the cards that, uh, uh, that I have. Did anyone else in the audience wish to speak on item 3A, the co proposed complete streets policy? All right, I'll open up the questions or comments from members of this uh, council. Councilman Gates. 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to start off by thanking staff uh, for, for all their great work uh, on this item and also the Complete Streets Working Group, John and everyone. Uh, there was a, a lot of work put into this and, and, and some important changes that were made. So I think the subcommittee process worked the way that, that it should. I want to thank uh, the chair of the Transportation Infrastructure Subcommittee um, and for the work that was done there to get this in, in the right place. Um, because this is a large undertaking. I agree with Councilman DeCicio. You know, this is where the market is headed, but we want to make sure that we do this in a responsible way. And I think it's very important here that what we're doing, if it is approved by the council today, sets the, the direction, but a lot of the specifics uh, still need to be done. And uh, so everything that we can do working together, I think is going to be very beneficial. Um, this is something, this concept of becoming more multimodal, uh, adding bike lanes and making things more pedestrian friendly is something I've been working in my district on. Uh, Ray Dovalina has been working with us hard along 32nd Street and I know a lot of my colleagues have been doing the same. So I think this is really going to set the, the structure in place so that this can be successful uh, uh, throughout the city. So uh, again, I want to thank everyone. Uh, the working group have, has put a great amount of, of effort into this and what part of what we will be doing here is setting up that working group moving forward and putting that structure into place so that we can really have a, 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 a um, working uh, group and a um, complete streets policy in the city of Phoenix that's second to none. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very yeah. much. Other uh, comments from members of Council Vice Mayor, you have questions? Yep. Uh, thanks. Is there anything about this that basically costs us money or locks us into doing things we might not normally want to do? Does it make it more expensive to build streets? Mayor, uh, um, Vice Mayor, regarding that question, all of our streets are currently designed for a certain standard. Uh, we already do uh, ADA, American Disabilities Act, so a lot of the standards that we have in place kind of conform to complete streets. It's more on the, the mentality of how we're going to be looking at corridors and how do we introduce other elements in, in a context-sensitive design process where we're looking at more than just the street of moving traffic, it's moving people. So we're going to make an effort to make sure that we're looking at moving people, not just traffic. Because you and I had talked, Mayor, if I can, um, you and I had talked about for my district, you're already basically implementing this when you design new streets or corridors or anything else. That's already happening. Is that correct? Uh, yes, Ma Vice Mayor. So in our area, in District 2, northern part of Phoenix, it's nothing really new under the sun. We're really talking about sort of more down the central corridor, redeveloping, that kind of thing. Um, is that a fair statement? Uh, yes, Vice Mayor. Uh, in looking at different uh, corridors, as, as we're working with 32nd, for example, 32nd Street north of, uh, of the mountain, uh, in that case, uh, that situation, previously that corridor was uh, um, running about 40,000 vehicles per day. And because of the freeway coming through that area, th that character of that road has totally changed. So we're, we're actively looking at working with the communities to look at what are the changes that need to be done for those particular quarters where things have changed for the last 25 or 30 years and seeing what amenities can be uh, included in working with our current existing program, for example, an overlay program that we're going to be looking at for that corridor on 32nd Street to have an opportunity to reduce the lane com uh, configuration and include bike lanes. So we're already doing that uh, overlay program. Uh, and then just looking at other opportunities to include a more complete street corridor. So those are the things that we're going to be looking forward uh, with this uh, complete streets program to look at other opportunities throughout the city. Thanks. Uh, you know, people have complained to me about quality of streets in our neighborhoods. Uh, you know, we have, I've talked, you and I have talked about this and Wiley before you about uh, potholes and, and things like that. Obviously, we're a little stretched for money. At this point, some of it we can immediately fix, some of it we can't. I just want to make sure anybody watching at home doesn't think we're embarking on some um, expensive new venture uh, when we're not taking care of sort of the practical reality of our day-to-day -day living right now. I don't, I don't believe that's the case, but I want to make sure that that's clear. We're not really designing streets, any specific streets here, and we're not really paying for anything that's expensive above and beyond what we're doing now with this in 3A, I guess I should say. Mayor and Vice Mayor, uh, exactly. Uh, again, it's more of a methodology of how we're going to be looking at each individual corridor and working not only with city projects but also with the development community. And you had said uh, you're already sort of implementing this in our district with, without this. Uh, does this lock us in to doing things in the future? Uh, I sort of asked this before, but I want to make sure I ask it so it's clear. 
uh, does this lock us into doing things a certain way that might be more expensive, thus prohibiting us? Um, another way to ask it might be, uh, is this a must rather than shall situation? We have to do something and now we can't do it because we don't have the money sometime in the future. Do you understand what I'm at? It sounds like you do, you're nodding your head. Yeah. Mayor and Vice Mayor, uh, there's a couple of things. Uh, Map 21, the, the new transportation bill uh, in getting as a community, getting uh, federal funds from the transportation uh, back uh, from DC, there is a re some requirements in uh, making sure that a community is looking at a complete streets program and with that, with that aspect. Secondly, uh, all of our streets that, we're, that we are doing right now, if, if it's a, a city street uh, project or a development project, we already l are looking at ADA uh, components, sidewalks, uh, uh, appropriate uh, standards for corridors for, for, dry, uh, for the vehicle um, aspect. So I think we're already doing a lot of these things, but I think this is gonna provide a more comprehensive look at individual projects, looking at a holistic approach of complete streets and making sure that we're doing those projects uh, in, in a holistic manner with uh, addressing the complete streets. My, 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 let me give you take a whack at it is that, you know, probably is, I want to make sure we not leave a false impression for viewers at home. As we design new streets, uh, we're, we're going to be adding elements like, not everywhere, but, but often um, protected bike lanes. We're going to be maybe having wider sidewalks. We're going to probably be having, hopefully, more, think about shade a lot more and you know, and if we haven't done that in the past, certainly there will be a more expense associated with uh, new design roads and the retrofitting of our existing roads as we uh, repair our and make improvements to our existing road. So it may be more expensive, quote unquote, uh, in the short run, but imagine the expense of not doing this in the long run uh, and we continue to have a sprawl city, uh, a traffic oriented streets, we don't continue to urbanize in the way that we need to if we're gonna advance our economy. So I mean, my impression is that you could look at it multiple ways, the, the short-term cost of a street design that takes into account all users, including bike users and walk and, and pedestrian users, et cetera, but you could look at the cost of not doing it. And so I think overall, this is a good investment for the city, even though it may be a quote unquote more expensive in, in the immediate design of new streets. Mr. City Manager. Mayor, you, you captured it correctly. Certainly, I'll use an example that we just did. The pool we just built at Cortez Park is more expensive than a pool that would be like the one at Encanto Park, where it's just a plain box. The pool at Encanto Park has things for kids, slides. So yes, it's more expensive, but it also attracts and serves more people. So I think we, you're right, we wanna be clear. Complete Streets does, uh, is more expensive than just the plain streets of the past but it serves people in a different way for the future, and I think that's the policy that's being set here is to do that. Vice Mayor, Vice Mayor please. You. I appreciate it. Uh, so I know some of you guys are pressed for time, uh, but uh, so you talked about some of the things that are mandated by the federal government that are in this. Some things aren't mandated for the, by the federal government. Those things that aren't, by voting for this today, we're locking ourselves in going forward to doing bike lanes that maybe the feds aren't saying we have to do, but now we will have to do on streets going forward. Is that a fair statement? Uh, Mayor and Vice Mayor, uh, to some degree, yes. Uh, we're also, as, as uh, we've talked about with the city council, is that we are working with the bike plan, master plan, and so those are gonna define some of the corridors that we're gonna have and more of an emphasis on where bikes would be included, so uh, for bike corridors. So uh, to some degree, yes, there's gonna be an added cost to that. So we are limiting our flexibility in designing streets in the future. Right, that's right. All right, Councilman Gates wants to take a whack at uh, answering that, but Mr. Lee, you have more as well, please. If, if you don't mind, I'm sure you would have done a mess, much better job than I will, Ray. But actually, um, Vice Mayor, I had these concerns in subcommittee because previously the policy said shall, shall, shall throughout, which is very clear under Arizona law. That means must. That's so, why I used that word when I asked yeah, the question earlier. Very well. And, and so. so if you look at it, now we went from a policy in subcommittee to an ordinance that basically gives a general direction and sets up the, the working group moving forward. And specifically, it says in here, city streets will, will, not shall, will, be planned, designed, constructed, et cetera, to encourage walking, bicycling, all these things in accordance with current design standards. So we have current design standards now. Now they're gonna go out and create new design standards. So to answer your question, no, we're not locking ourselves into anything because we haven't changed the design standards yet. When the design standards come, which have the complete street concepts in them, and that's gonna drive things, 
then we will be at a, a, at a point uh, where we're actually making those decisions. Right now, we're creating the framework, giving the general direction, but I, I would argue we're not committing to specific items today with this. And everyone, feel free to correct me. Are you going to tell us how wrong Councilman Gates was? Or <laughs> Mayor? Mayor? No take on that one, Bill, right. <laughs> looks like. All right, just a moment. Uh, Councilman Williams? Uh, thank you, Mayor. And I want to thank the committee, too. Uh, and staff for putting a lot of work on this because I know in the subcommittee um, you were drilled and uh, Councilman Gates did an excellent job of being a lawyer and uh, looking through all the documents and changed all those shells to will. But I, I am like Vice Mayor uh, in the northern area. Um, it's different than downtown. It's constructed different. And where you have many homes down here that actually face on the streets, you don't have that up north. All you see are walls. And so I guess what I'm saying to this committee is, is it goes forth and you develop policies and, and procedures. I want you to be extra sensitive of the transition from here going northward. When you get far north, it's built to the new standard, but you've got that intermittent area that is very walled off. And my concern is bicycle lanes, kids on bikes, crossings, how safe are they? And I want to make sure that you really look at that uh, along that way because there's no parent that can look out the front and see a kid. No one sees anybody on those bikes or even walking down the sidewalks. So I want to make sure we take extra uh, care on any in intersection and the way that the bike lanes are constructed. The construction of bike lanes, because I specifically asked staff for the price um, and what it would take to, to retrofit streets. A mile of restriping for a bike lane is $10,000 a mile. Narrowing existing lanes and restriping is 90000 a mile. Eliminating existing lanes and restriping for four lanes is 121000 per mile. Six lanes is 200000 per mile. And if it includes a roadway shoulders, it's 115,000 per mile. Now that's doing a lot of work. I mean, it's not just walking down with a paintbrush and painting a stripe. It, there's a lot more to it, I've learned. Uh, but I, I too am very concerned um, because we have so many streets that need repaired that this doesn't get bumped up with a higher priority and those streets don't get repaired. I think we have to make sure that we balance uh, the community's needs because uh, we don't have very much money and we're going to have to really look and prioritize and decide how we can do this where it's advantageous, where it makes the most sense, uh, common sense to begin and make sure it's continuous so that we don't have gaps along the way. You're in and out of a bike lane. You're in and out of multimodal. Um, I just think it takes careful planning, and I have a lot of faith no. that this committee is going to look at all of this, and I am sure you're going to have committee members from all the districts involved, whether they love bikes or don't love bikes, uh, so that we have all the views represented. But I really want to thank you, because I think this, this will make a difference in this city. Uh, Years ago, it was for landscaping. We had to have trees. Well, nobody still walked, and the trees all died. So I'm hoping this fits in with a landscaping plan that your parks or somebody's updating that will benefit so that when we get a complete street, it is complete, that there are shade trees, that there are walkable sidewalks, that there are uh, access for wheelchairs to get in and off the pavement that they can get to the bus ramps, that it's all included uh, so that all the departments are working together and we make this uh, cohesive unit that uh, breaks down the silos between the departments, because we've talked about that. Um, and I think it is the future of the city of Phoenix. I think it will be great for all of our citizens. Uh, but I think it takes careful planning and the implementation is gonna be the key. So I would like to have uh, you bring back uh, updates every six months, maybe to the uh, Transportation Subcommittee. Tell us how the committee is progressing, um, their ideas. Um, definitely anything that has potential to be uh, controversial, um, but we would, would prefer to hear it in advance from you all 
um, and help resolve the matter. So, but again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Councilman. But I actually, that's, I think it should raise a fair question and maybe talk about that. Uh, how will you take into account geographical differences in the city? Uh, uh, you know, 51st Avenue and Happy Valley Road versus uh, 7th Avenue and McDowell. Mayor and the City Council, uh, when we went through the public outreach process, we went to each of the 15 villages, and it was very enlightening when you meet with the members of the uh, Village Planning Committee from the Central City, and then um, the next day you may go out to Rio Vista. They had different needs, different requirements. Um, when we were uh, up north, their primary consideration was how can they have better access to I-17. Um, we, when we talked more about complete streets, we, we talked about pulling um, certain tools from a toolbox. There may, they may need um, a safer pathway to one of their schools. They need better crossing. So I think we can be very context sensitive with each of the districts um, regarding their needs and begin to put together a list that really accommodates a context sensitivity for each of the districts. Thank you very much, Councilor Nowakowski. You know, Mayor, I just really want to thank you all for putting this committee together. I'd like to find out who's actually on this Phoenix Complete Streets Working Group. Do you have a list of those individuals, or, or, do, or can you give it to us later or read them off? Uh, Mayor and, and Councilman Nowakowski, uh, we, we can certainly provide uh, that listing. We do have some, uh, some of those folks here uh, in the audience, and, uh, uh, but we certainly can provide that listing to you. Already, and then the other thing is that, you know, District 7 is so diverse, we have the Levine Estrella Village, which is new development. We even have horse trails out there, right? That's one of the requirements in the Levine area. So, you know, I think when you look at different areas, just like Councilwoman um, Williams was talking about, we have unique areas, unique um, um, villages. I mean, you talk about Caesar Towers Park, you talk about Desert West Park. Some of the key um, transportation for those parks are skateboarding, because those are two big major skate parks where skateboarders are actually looking for ways to take their skateboards up to the um, sta skate parks. So there's different things. I just really want you to work really close with all the different stakeholders. I mean, if you look right now down 2nd Avenue, I mean, that was really brought up because we were able to get all the stakeholders together. And it's a beautiful walkway through City Hall all the way to Margaret Hans Park. If you look at 1st Street, same situation. We got together all the stakeholders all the way from Margaret Hands to, to Washington. And you look at Grand Avenue, getting all the artists and all the individuals that have businesses and what they've created there and, and the city and your department, Ray, um, coming up with the funding to actually make these dreams come true. So I think when you get people together, when you get the community together, they, they actually find the resources also. And if we, as the city of Phoenix, don't have those resources, I think that we can use outside um, partnerships so I think it's really important that we look at the diversity of our city, especially when we talk about South Phoenix and Maryville, that um, I have parts that I represent, that we don't have that connection. Well, if you want to ride a bike from South Phoenix to downtown, it's almost um, impossible to do so without almost getting hit. So when we talk about complete streets, when we talk about bike routes, that we really look for that master plan. We include people from all diversity, from Maryville to South Phoenix, to make sure that they're connected. Sometimes when we talk about downtown Phoenix, we end right there at Jefferson, but I think downtown goes beyond Jefferson, so we need to look beyond Jefferson and do these complete streets also. So thank you so much for all your guys. Is, um, it's about time that we have a plan. I know we've been doing this bits and pieces, but now we're gonna have a plan, so thank you and I'll be supporting it. Thank you very much, uh, Councilman. Councilman DeCicio. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I do also want to thank the group that worked on this. I know it was very hard, very complicated, took a considerable amount of time. And thank you for all your effort and the staff for putting this together. And let me just give you just a couple thoughts on this as well. And I want to give special thanks to Councilman Gates for making some of the changes in subcommittee because the, the one thing you want to understand at the very beginning is really that the city is very diverse. We have, and our diversity creates our strength and because of the diversity, we have different needs. So the flexibility in the plan is critical. So what fits in downtown Phoenix may not very well fit in Levine, may not very well fit in you know, the northern part. And oh, before I get too far into it, the one woman, the Latina, I forgot your name, ma'am. My, my, what is it, Sylvia? 
nice to meet you. Uh, my mother and father, my dad's watching this right now too, they walked every day until they were 80, uh, over three miles a day, and now they still walk, so mom and dad, I hope you did your walk there early this morning, I know they're watching this on TV right now, but if you look at our diversity, that is critical, and what this does, this plan, this model that was created, literally puts in place a plan of how we want our city to look, and sometimes that does cost money. And it is what it is. I mean, if you look at it, and I'll tell you, it, I had an opportunity with Brandy Leepak. She's a small business owner. I think some of you may know her, real involved in the biking community. We did the biking for reading. And um, it was phenomenal. I mean, if you look at it, one of the comments she made that really stuck in my brain for quite a while literally was this, was that when you see people outdoors, when you see people on bicycles, it tells people that are not from there what that community is like, what the diversity in that area is like. So when you see people out and about walking around and encouraging people to walk door to, you know, walk out in, in their community, you see them outside their front doors, it tells people, hey, this is pretty neat. This is a quality of life issue. This is a, a nice area for me to want to live in, a nice place I want to see my kids. When you see kids playing outside, what's the first thing you think of? I've got two little kids, I know some of us do too, but the first thing you think of, hey, wow, this is kind of neat, maybe they could be friends with my children. There's a lot of things that go through your head and it increases and improves our quality of life in our community, in our city. So if you look at this plan that was created here, um, it literally puts in place that level of diversity, some changes, but it does set in place, I wanna be really clear about this, a plan that bike lanes are important that shade is important. These types of things are important to our community and we wanna see that in our community. So it does put that, and one thing I wanna make sure people understand is that when the city of Phoenix puts the word will, doesn't mean shall, but it's pretty close. <laughs> so remember that we're putting in place a policy that gives direction for long term of how you can accommodate with it. Now, now that I've got transportation here and others of the, at the top of the city, this has been kind of a pet peeve of mine if you look at, um, and I'm gonna keep ringing this bell until, I, you know, until everyone hears it, flexibility is critical to a diverse city. And if you look at the, uh, the bridal path in my district, North Central Phoenix, and you've heard me say this before, you can't replicate that again because the codes don't allow you to do it. So the flexibility and the thing that makes North Central the iconic place that it is and people love to live there the, the bridal path, and you can't build that anymore in the city of Phoenix. It's, it, you're not allowed to do it. So when we look at flexibility and we look at alternative uh, options that we might have as we're building a city and creating a place for people to want to live and work, look at places that give us the character and ask yourself, could we do this again in the baseline corridor? Could we do this again in certain parts of Felda's district? And you can't. So find ways to incorporate those things that make our city beautiful and special and reincorporate those into some other living document that we have. I'm very supportive of this. I'm very excited about it. Um, if I didn't vote for this, my wife would kill me. Uh, she's a big biker. <laughs> so she was my biggest lobbyist. I had when we were doing the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the budget hearings, the biking community was out there. I said, look, you don't have to say anything. I've heard it all. <laughs> and I hear it every day. So. Uh, but connectivity with bike lanes is critical. It's a safety issue as well. Not only is it a quality of life, but, and I've seen it on a computer and I've seen it throughout people mapping their, their paths because they're able to see where they're gonna hit traffic and that is even more unsafe than not having it there. So as you move forward, this is all part of being a city. It's all part of being a, a community. It is literally about recognizing multiple things. One, you heard me say this earlier, it is this is where the economy is going. This is what the demands are on this city from those who want to live in our city. A lot of this has already been done in other areas of the district, like Councilman Waring's others and other places. It's already been there. But there are certain parts of Central Phoenix that is not here that this needs to be done. The other part of it is this is also part of where you want your city to look like. And you know, without micromanaging and social engineering, we can create things that people are looking to do where the market is moving us, and that this is where the market is moving us. Thank you, Mayor.
Thank you very much, uh, Councilman, Additional, Councilwoman Gallego. Uh, thank you very much. I had the pleasure of chairing the Environmental Quality Commission about three and a half years ago when we were the first body to ask the city to develop a complete streets policy. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you to Ray, who's been with us from the very beginning, and many of the members of the Complete Streets Working Group, but especially Vincent Lopez, who I think month after month for more than three years has been making sure that we have had good data. He's with the Maricopa County uh, Public Health and well-informed, and I really want to thank you for the hours and hours that you've put into this in addition to the whole Complete Streets Working Group. So can we give them a round of applause for their long work on this? <laughs> I hope many of you will continue to be involved in this and will express interest. Each of us here gets to appoint a member of the, uh, of the public to represent our districts, and I think that many of you are the best suited. You've already done a lot of work to develop metrics on this issue, and. Uh, Councilwoman Pastor was the first to point out at subcommittee how important metrics are. She said, I'm a teacher. I want to know how we're going to measure how well we're doing with this. And you've already done a lot of great work, so I hope that as we move forward, we will capitalize on all that hard work because this is an ordinance today, but it will be those numbers that really drive what we're doing. And we still have a lot of work to, to do in this area. Uh, Councilman Nolkowski and I represent many areas that were county islands and that do not have complete streets yet. And Every day I wake up and see who has uh, tagged me on Facebook to inform me of a bus shelter that needs a shade structure in, in the Levine area. And this says that this will be a priority for us, that our, we're not just designing streets for cars to move quickly and that that is not a successful street that we really do have to think about all of our users, those individuals who are right now crowding behind a little pole for an inch of, of shade and in the future they'll have bus shelters to rest in as they go to work. And we're also thinking about our entrepreneurs and the business community. Teresa and others spoke eloquently about how much this will drive investment and how financial institutions really are looking to prioritize investing in areas with complete streets. I know with the fastest growing businesses in my district, they're the ones who are demanding bike share uh, organizations like WebPT who really want us to be doing this and who say their employees want to be able to bike and walk around. They don't want to just drive. They want to be out in the community and interacting. As, as the token millennial on the council, I know that the majority of people graduating from college <coughs> decide where they want to live before they apply for jobs, and having that robust, vibrant downtown will really help attract people to our great city and help us get more of those entrepreneurs. So this is about streets and transportation, but it's really also an economic development tool, and look forward to going forward on this. I hope that as we coordinate between city departments, it will be real coordination where we take some of the work we've also gotten through reInvent Phoenix about different codes and challenges and, and silos within the city and combine that work together so that when we say coordination, it's not just emailing 10 people to check a box and say, I checked with the other departments, but really bringing people together and, and solving problems. So this will be a great tool for us. And I'm so glad after many years we are moving forward it. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Councilwoman Token Millennial. Uh, any other uh, comments? By I'm members of this council, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Um, so Councilman Gates, I, and I appreciate his efforts in uh, stepping this back slightly in the subcommittee, but is there going to be another vote? Because uh, I think a couple of us were asking that question. At some point when you come back with stand the actual standards, or is this it? Mayor and Vice Mayor, there are uh, several components within the, the overall program of Complete Streets, so certainly, yes, there are going to be components that are going to be coming back to the city council for or concurrence and, and approval um, at that point. We do have a policy that we would we would move forward. So there's four components, uh, the ordinance, policy, guidelines, and uh, s design standards. So all of those components overall are the Complete Streets program. So moving forward, certainly we're gonna come back to, to this body and make sure that we have those concurred and approved. Because I definitely have concerns to Councilman DeCicio's point. Um, you know, it may not be shell, but it's pretty darn close. I mean, it really is. So we're locking ourselves in. I feel somewhat needlessly, given that we're already doing this, we could do this sort of voluntarily. Um, I don't think we necessarily need to lock ourselves in to the point where I'm concerned. I think Councilman Williams touched on it. Our districts are a little different. They're a little more drive oriented, a little more spread out. Uh, you know, you're not, you can get a few. I, I have known people who actually ride their bikes downtown every day, and I'm not saying every person works downtown, but you're not gonna have as many people certainly riding a bike downtown 
Um, it would be nice to provide lanes for them, but from our area, it's 20 plus miles away. That's not realistic for most people, me included. Um, you know, I, I would be concerned that, and again, I think Councilman Williams touched on it, uh, that you're gonna be pushing out funding for things like repairing Tatum, which is a major thoroughfare in uh, well, a lot of the city, but that goes right through the heart of my district. You know, a few months ago, I had had quite a few complaints uh, that it was fairly torn up, nothing was gonna happen, I don't think it was on anybody's list to fix. You know, I finally went out there with, I forget who from, from your office, and we drove it, and we're like, okay, it needs to be fixed. I mean, at some point, it's gonna become a safety hazard. We're going through the same thing with Cape Creek now. I just worry about for this, might send the wrong impression that we have other priorities than fixing streets, and I get, frankly, a lot of complaints about our streets from people or commuters who drive every day. Councilman Williams talked about our districts are different. Our districts are different than downtown. Doesn't mean they're better or worse. They're just different. And uh, for example, the Hawk that we installed last year at my request by Greenway High School, um, for those who aren't familiar, it's basically a stoplight without a cross street. Um, you know, my kids are four years old, but if they were 45, I wouldn't necessarily encourage them to cross <laughs> Greenway which is a bunch of lanes of traffic at 56th Street. That's not necessarily, I mean, we put in the hawk to make it safer for those who want to, but, but it's, it's concerning the street makeup and the size of the streets, you know, Bell, Cactus, Union Hills, I lived right on Cactus. Um, would I necessarily, we have the sidewalks, everything you're talking about, ADA accessible, but I really want my kids riding on Cactus down to the, to the mall, down the street. Mm. You know, that's a little bit different than some of the stuff you're talking about. It's a pretty big street, a lot of stuff happens there, bad accidents, had a fatal accident uh, just last week, I think it was. So I think Councilman Williams talked about a lot of the things that I'm talking about. I'm just a little concerned we're locking ourselves in that that may affect upkeep in our area going forward. Um, and I just, I don't know why that's necessary right the second when we have obviously a fiscal shortfall, we have a shortfall in our street repair, et cetera. You and I have talked about this a number of times. So I just wanna make those points, just different districts uh, with different needs and with the, the, the diversity, I'm just not sure this one size fits all plan is necessarily what we want right now, or you should have anyway. All right, Mayor. next another, uh, other, uh, Councilman Gallego, please. Somewhat to my frustration, there aren't the metrics in this plan right now, so those will still be developed and, and going forward. But this is important for addressing the concerns that Councilman Waring mentioned. If we are gonna be looking to the federal government as a partner, they are gonna demand that we do this and to ask about it. And I think it will benefit people who ride the bus, which I think are in um, all of our council districts and we don't have any buses. All right, thank you very much, Councilman DeCicio. Oh. Uh, nope, I apologize. Mm -hmm. Councilman DeCicio. Yeah, and I think Councilman Waring brings up a critically important part here as you're moving forward with these metrics. You've got to take into consideration what's happening. Now, this is an overall policy which sets a direction and tone for the city as you move forward. But the plan, and when I said the word, that when we set this in place, it's pretty sure that that's where it goes. But as you come back with your metrics, there has to be an identification in there. Uh, and you know, that's, you, if you don't have it, then you have really nothing. You just have words on a piece of paper. You've gotta be able to put your plan in place. I assume you're going to do that, is that correct? Mayor and Councilman DeCiso, yes, sir. And then what I would recommend, and whatever motion's put on the table, is that you work hand in hand with a district council member so that they are helping guide you you can't have just, you know, no way any one group can guide what happens in this entire city. There's just no way it can do that. But that's what, they're, that's what everybody up here is elected to do, that you work hand in hand with each of the council members in their districts. Like in mine, I like almost all of it. I mean, if not all, you know, because it fits my model, it fits my district. But if you look north at what Councilman Waring was talking about, if you did this in some of his areas, you're literally taking monies away from other safety issues that could be there and other quality of life ish, other quality of life types of projects that he needs to have more in his district and Councilman Williams needs to have in their district. So that type of diversity that we talked about, you're gonna need to put in, the, in this plan on each of the different districts and how it looks and how that model looks. All right. And that's the way it should be. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Councilman, uh, very much. I'm almost uh, done. You have more? Yeah. Go right ahead, please no finish up. Yep. Okay, and then the other part of it, when you're looking at the cost of this, um, we have to know what the cost of, the, of, of it is moving forward. So when you look at what Councilwoman Williams talked about with the striping and all that, we wanna be able to weigh 
what that is compared to other things that we're going to be able to do. So as you move forward with that, you got to tell us what the total costs are going to be in each of our districts and how it's going to look and how it's going to impact other projects in there as well. So cost, metrics, plan, because right now these are just guidelines moving forward. And how long will it take you to have this plan in place and with the metrics in place? How long is it going to take? Mayor and Councilman DeCicio, we're going to be working towards uh, for the formation of the body of the uh, committee and then work with them to develop the, the policy determination and then also looking at an overall plan and then the, uh, rolling out the schedule of that. But we're going to be working with that committee. Well, I know, but when do you think you can get a plan to this council in place? Uh, it's always nice to do these kinds of things, but unless you have a set guidelines and time frames, nothing ever gets done. Mayor and Councilman DeCicio, uh, what I would say is in the next six to 12 months, we would be coming back to, to, the, to this body for, uh, for that plan. Well, that's a long time. So, I mean, six months to 12 months, that's a, it's, you might as well say five years from now. More definitiveness, if you can give us at some point. The other part of it is when we create this committee, are each council member going to have somebody from their district on there? And that goes to Councilman Nowakowski's question. Yes, Mayor and uh, Councilman DeCicio. We, we look for 11 representatives uh, from the community with representatives from each of the districts. That uh, we choose, right? Well, yeah, that are nominated by, um, by the, each of the council districts and then um, uh, approved by city council. In the and so in other words, the council will have each a representative from their district that can represent their district. And then the mayor obviously will have two or three more appointments themselves too. Two, two at large, and, okay. then, and then eight representatives non-voting from um, eight various uh, city departments. Okay, so everybody up here will have a point, an appointee. Okay, then that creates the diversity, I think, that allows us to move forward too. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you very much uh, for those comments. I don't want to leave a false impression though. If this moves forward, each councilman won't be able to dictate uh, each street that uh, moves forward with this uh, policy. It's going to have to meet the dictates of the policy uh, itself. Uh, and so we're, because I, I don't want to minimize what we're voting on here today in any regard. I don't think anybody up here wants to uh, minimize well, this. this is an I don't important, think anyone's uh, dictating. I'm, I'm speaking now, Councilman. Uh, so I want to make sure that uh, it is clear that this sets forward a very important policy for uh, the city of Phoenix. And I think it's great that we're assuming that we get a motion in favor of it, that we are moving forward with this, um, uh, with this policy. Uh, it sets forward a policy, and, and that's the reason why the advocates were here, that uh, the streets of our community are for everyone. Uh, they are not exclusively for cars. They are not predominantly for cars, that pedestrians, uh, bikers, small businesses along the street, uh, all the p users of our uh, street system um, have a seat at the table and should be represented not only how we make policy, but how people use the street. And yes, in some quarters this is controversial, but a lot of people do think that the primary users of, of the street should be for cars and the planning should be accordingly. And this is a sea change in how we think about uh, how we plan for and how we expend money for uh, the future of our future streets as well as uh, going back and redeveloping uh, our existing streets when major street changes are made. We're gonna, we're gonna make those changes with pedestrians and uh, bikers uh, public transportation, uh, small businesses uh, uh, along the way have an equal seat uh, at the table. So it is an important sea change uh, in how we move forward streets. And we're going to implement that through various means here, and then we're going to give a approval for the staff to move forward with it. But I don't want to make sure we don't, we don't minimize in any regard what is happening uh, here today. And we heard from many speakers, and I agree 100%. This is not just great for the street users, it is great for economic development because the kind of jobs and companies and entrepreneurs that we are trying to recruit to our city, many of the people that we're trying to retain in our city is exactly the kind of thing that they are demanding from their, uh, from their city. Uh, we get, I get this as, you know, I spend more of my time as mayor than anything else on economic development and recruitment. And the issue of complete streets in terms of walkability, bikeability is a hugely important element uh, in location decisions or uh, retention. So this is good, smart economic policy uh, as well. So I'm going to turn to Council Nikowski to see if we have a motion on this issue, see if we get a second, and then we can have any further debate knowing that for some members of the council, the clock is ticking. Mayor, I'd like to um, make a recommendation on staff's recommendation to approve this 
complete streets ordinance. You imagine? Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Additional comments? Mayor, Councilman Williams, please. Uh, Ray, tell me one more time. You've got four components. Are you bringing each of those back for us to consider and vote on? Or is this the overlying principle and everything be damned and you're just going to go forward? My, I, you know, I've lived through this before. We may, said we were going to do this diversity and we'd all work together and it didn't happen. And I'm just really, really concerned about this because I believe in what you're doing. I think multimodal is, is important. And I think for economic development and livability in this city, it is important to go forth with this. But how it's implemented is the key and, and addressing the needs in the various areas of the city to me is very important. And I don't have a comfort level. A mayor and Councilwoman uh, Williams, uh, certainly all of the, the, the overall program, the policy, the guidelines, the standards, certainly we're going to bring those forward. Uh, we're also going to be, as, as mentioned, uh, working with the committee, but there's also a lot of other stakeholders, uh, the advocacy groups, uh, the development community, so working with them to make sure that we have a solid program with all of the individual uh, elements of the program we're going to bring forth and based on those recommendations working with those bodies we're going to bring those uh, elements to this uh, to the city council for approval for approval mayor cool thank you very much uh, councilman gates yep thank you mayor uh, again you know, i support the principles that are outlined here today but to be very clear all we're voting on is an ordinance number 1 ordinance we're voting on that number 2 policy not here today not voting on it going to vote on it in the future Number three, guidelines, not here today, not voting on it. Number four, standards, not here today, not voting on it. Specifically, the ordinance that we're being asked to vote upon says city streets will be planned, designed, constructed, and maintained to support and encourage walk, walking, bicycling, and transit use in accordance with current design standards to be supplemented by complete streets design manual upon adoption. So we're supporting these concepts, I think we all agree upon today, in accordance with current design standards. So just want to be very clear. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor. Thank you very much. Councilman, please. And then also part of the uh, motion, I assume, is when we, this committee, just let's see, yes or no, is going to have each member of this council is going to be able to represent, have one of their representative that they choose an appointee from their district. Is that correct, Councilman Okowski? Uh, that's correct. Basically what it is, it's um, to create a complete streets guideline and principles which will establish a complete streets advisory and infrastructure subcommittee which will have representatives from each of our council district and two representatives from the mayor's office. That we choose our appointees. Correct. Okay, good. And then the other is, um, and I want to make sure because we're using language that I want to make sure the public understands. The sea of change is not until we get the guidelines in place. Okay, the guidelines in place will then. This is just, a, and I'm glad you brought that up, Councilman Gates, because I was going to drive this home, but I'm glad you did. It is not there until we know what it is. Right now, we're just giving you some direction. Basically, is the way I see it of where we'd like the city to go until it's in writing, until you have metrics in place, until you've communicated with each of the districts. And for those that are watching this and seeing part of it, this is literally about transparency and making sure that every district is represented the way that their district would like to see it. We don't want anyone dictating to any one area of town how they should live their lives. We just want to give them some ideas of how they want to do that. For certainly my district would not want to tell the downtown area what they should and shouldn't do. Likewise, they don't want to be told either. So everybody has different needs in their areas, and that's what this is all about today. So I'm going to be supporting the motion. I like the fact that we'll be able to put our own appointees on there. Um, thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. I, I also I agree that we don't leave a false impression. I don't want to leave an impression that certain parts of the city may or may not be exempt from such uh, policy, that if we adopt this policy about uh, the equality, if you will, of pedestrians, bikes, public transportation, small business on equal value of cars, that that's not going to be, certain parts of the city are not going to be exempt from that uh, policy. And so I don't want to leave that false impression uh, either. This is an important, what we're adopting here today is important. We're going to get down to the guidelines as we uh, should, 
Uh, but this is, this, when I say it's a sea change, exactly what I'm talking about is we've never adopted this as our policy uh, before. I might politely suggest that previously we had put vehicular traffic, at, if you look at the way the city of Phoenix streets had been designed, we had put vehicular traffic uh, preeminent in, in our uh, planning and we've tried to retrofit on special examples. From this point forward, if this is adopted, our policy will be to put all of the users of our uh, street system on an equal, uh, equal level. So I'll be sure it's clear that's what I was uh, talking about and that there won't be parts of the city that will be exempt uh, from that. Council, uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, and that's part of the reason that I think I'm gonna wind up voting against this today. Uh, it's not that it's a bad idea. It's not, as Councilman Gallego said, it's not that it's, uh, or the mayor, I can't remember one of you, talking about the future and the economic impact and so forth, and that's undoubtedly true, but I'm also a pragmatist. Spoke earlier about uh, streets. You mentioned the 32nd Street corridor, which is most of what we talked about is in Councilman Gates's district, but there's also some of it that's in my district uh, between basically the 51 where it breaks and then up to say Union Hills or a little north. Um, we've discussed that quite a bit. A lot of the things that you've talked about, uh, we're gonna be incorporating in that, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend that for every single street. And when push comes to shove, we have limited resources. With those limited resources, of course, we'd like to build great pedestrian walkways for everybody and so forth, but we have limited resources. And I think in Councilman Williams' district and mine, you know, cars are the predominant mode of transportation. Uh, horses maybe in some neighborhoods, but, but cars most places. Uh, constituents will not be happy with me if we can't fix cracking streets, which is really the feedback I've gotten several times from you guys that we can't go ahead and take care of some of this stuff because we have limited funds and then we're spending money and redirecting resources to something that the majority of residents in my district aren't using. I'm not saying that shouldn't be the case in other districts. I'm just saying in my particular district, I don't want to have to answer that question, quite frankly. I don't want to have to be the deliverer of that message. Well, we voted for this thing, we locked ourselves in. You mentioned the federal government. Uh, the federal government has um, mandated quite a few things in here already. Uh, we're supplementing that to a certain extent. Uh, but my question is, won't the federal government, as they are want to do, and I'm not saying this is a good thing, it's just it's what happens, won't most of this stuff be mandated by them already? And if anything we do here conflicts with that, won't that be washed away because it's federal, not city? Mayor, Vice Mayor. Or Mayor, Vice Mayor, uh, right now, I mean, we're, we're always evaluating what we need to be addressing based on the regulations from the federal government. Uh, for example, just going back to 32nd Street, we're actually using federal funds to do that project, and some of those are the requirements uh, in using MAP 21 federal funds. So certainly, we, we're always looking at what we need to do for our projects. Also keeping in mind that a lot of the, de the, uh, the, s the street network has been developed by the development community. So we're working hand in hand and working moving forward with them as well to make sure that we're, we're in concert with the, some of the requirements that they're looking at for the city to, to build the infrastructure uh, that is out there. But if the federal government is mandating it, and they're, especially if they're paying for it, but we have to follow those rules anyway, no matter what we do here today. Ma Mayor, I just might say, I think Councilman Gallego said earlier, in order for us to compete for those federal funds, they expect that we have this policy in place. So it, it's becoming a prerequisite in order to get into the game with federal funding. Okay, because he said it differently, like they were mandating this. They can't mandate, right. it's just a matter of, ex okay. we accept federal All right, that, funds. That was what I took away from the way you said it, so I apologize. If we accept if federal money, we said. need to be prepared to do this, and this helps us be able to compete for the federal money to have this policy. All right, so we have a Mayor. motion in favor Mayor. of it. We have a second. Mayor. I think staff. Just for staff, too. Councilman, go ahead. Well, no, we're, this is a good debate to have here. I mean, we're we're I'm, I'm trying to be respectful. Council members have to leave at a certain time, and we oh. wanted to get, that's why That's why I was saying that. And then, okay. yeah, yeah, please, please go ahead. As quickly as uh, well. When we're talking about federal policy, ba basically the federal government set down some guidelines that we're trying to enforce here. I mean, if you read the language in this ordinance, I mean, you're going to come back to us later. I've got to reemphasize that. It's pretty benign. It is. It's very benign what we see in this ordinance here. It's what the standards come back later that are going to be critical. With the federal government, I don't think they're going to take any monies away if we don't do this, but this is one of the standards that they like to see, and we're just trying to comply with that. Is that correct? I think it's more it, we're going to be competing for federal funds, and so we'll be in competition with cities around the country. And so if we don't have a, a very aggressive complete streets policy will be at well, a disadvantage for competitive grants. Mayor, this is not aggressive. 
this is the plan is not great. It's pretty benign until the, we get the plan in place. That's the aggressive part. No, but I think the point was is that this is not a requirement. It's really they have a competitive grant program, and in many of the competitive grant programs, they're going to require that a city have a complete streets um, uh, policy. I'm not. I think We're most of us up here, here don't want to put a city of Phoenix. It's the right policy to adopt, but also we don't want to put ourselves in any kind of competitive disadvantage. In, in, the, in our ability to get our fair share of federal dollars. No, but I, Mr. I'm city Manager, do you have any, anything else? No, ma'am. Yeah, but, but that's, that's what correct. I was trying to make let, a let, point. Let, let, let the City Manager answer. Well, I I'll go was, back I to you, Council. I thought I had the floor originally. I, was, I asked him a quick question. Go ahead. Okay. Well, Mayor, that's correct. It, it, it puts us in line to right. compete for federal funds regionally and nationally. Thank you so, so much. Council, please. Yeah, and then just to finish up, again, it's not until we get the real structure in place that we're going to be able to see that with the committee so I want to make sure everyone you know, that's watching this, this is not a plan to take cars off the street or anything else. You're going to still have your cars. It's literally to put in place some standards that the city of Phoenix wants to see. And it's, it, it's very benign if you read the ordinance. It's the real plan that comes afterwards that's going to matter. Thank you. Can I All right, Council, call call please. Question. We can call for the question. Do we have a second? second. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? No. We have a no. Uh, motion passes. So the motion is in favor of uh, staff recommendation for the complete streets uh, uh, ordinance. Uh, we have a second. Roll call. Councilman DeCicio? Yes. Councilwoman Gallego? Yes. Councilman Gates? Yes. Councilman Nolkowski? Yes. Councilwoman Pastor? Yes. Councilman Valenzuela? Yes. Vice Mayor Waring? No. Councilwoman Williams? Yes. Mayor Stanton? Yes, so our complete streets ordinance passes on a eight to one uh, vote. Next item on the agenda is item number 3B. 3B is the proposed, uh, or the results of the downtown Phoenix comprehensive transportation study. This is for information discussion and possible uh, action. We saw the video, we had a presentation already by uh, staff, so I'll now go to the speaker cards on that item. First speaker we're gonna hear from is Steve Rosenstein on item 3B followed by Prince Arthur. Good, Good afternoon. You. Second week in a row you're seeing me in my best clothes, Mayor Stanton. Um, I don't know if anybody <laughs> noticed, but um, the guy that I was standing up there with was Michael Levine. Did you ever think you'd see that happen in your lifetime? It was um, a peaceful, beautiful moment. Thank it you. Was. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Michael had to go, but um, he was here to, to um, support me on this one. Um, about, well, let's go, let's go back. How much time do I have? Two minutes? Two minutes, although if you're in the middle of the point, we'll let you finish. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I moved out here from Chicago in 2001. I didn't know there was a downtown Phoenix. Moved from the city of Chicago up to North Scottsdale. And about five years after moving out here, um, we sold a business, found ourselves living in a beautiful gated golf community up in North Scottsdale, bored out of our minds. Somebody sent me a picture of one of Michael Levine's buildings in the warehouse district. And our first day off as retirees, we came down to downtown Phoenix, Lincoln and Central, and we found a building that now houses the Deuce, which is our new concept. I've seen a lot of you in there drinking PBRs and Moscow Mules and whatever. But that's our place. Um, and it's really a, um, it's a Phoenix community center, um, really under one historic roof. We do everything there from great bar, restaurant, music, boxing, venues, weddings, bar mitzvahs. Um, we're a great, you know, after D-backs, after sons, hangout for people. And it's people from all walks of life, which is what we really wanted when we came down there. Um, we tell people, you check your ego and your balance sheet at the door. You can walk in there and see politicians, policemen, the auto mechanic up the road, a son's owner, a D-backs, GM, whoever it is. A lot of harmony in that place. Um, about two months ago, Mayor Stanton called me up and he asked me to put together an advocacy group. Does that mean I'm done? You, you can finish up the uh, general point as quickly as possible, but okay. it's important, please. Anyway, he asked me to put together a group of stakeholders in the warehouse district, which I did. Um, I formed a group called Authenticity Council. There's about 25 of us. Um, I think the point that I'd like to make today, and then I'll, I'll leave, um, we're going to form a connectivity group between us and the people on the other side of the tracks. Uh, the sons are our friends and our neighbors. Um, their fan base is huge to us, so 
before we move forward with this thing, give us an opportunity. Um, in four days, we've already formed Authenticity Council. We've formed a subcommittee. Um, we're working with, with Mayor Stan and his team on this, but I'd like an opportunity to form a connectivity group between us at Authenticity Council and the people with the Suns, D-backs, whoever it is on the other side that are gonna be affected by any changes like this. Thank you. Any questions for uh, Steve Rosenstein, a great business owner in the Warehouse uh, District. Councilwoman Gallego, it's your district. Yes. Thank you so much for coming and for your leadership. The Warehouse District has so much has done so much for our city and is a great part of our history. A lot of really special places in there, but with your group and your leadership, they're going to you'll be able to offer so much more to our city and be one of those destinations when people are here for the Super Bowl. They're going to head to the Warehouse District to see something they can't see anywhere else. Um, you mentioned that you'd like us to wait on moving forward with the downtown transportation study. Would you be comfortable if we passed the recommendations or the study but said that um, for the southern portion, portion of the city that we would do a connectivity study um, and then relook at everything on the southern portion but move forward? Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other questions for Steve? Is it true former Mayor Gordon is taking boxing lessons at the Deuce? No, former Mayor Gordon's son, Jake, is taking them. Ah, okay, he right, sits yes. there and drinks Moscow mules while his son <laughs> trains. But. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next time bring pictures, please. All right, next speaker is uh, Prince uh, uh, Arthur, followed by Bentley Calvary. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor and the members of the council. My name is Prince Arthur the Eighth. I'm actually a, a Phoenix resident. I'm also here on behalf of George Washington Copper Museum and Cultural Center, which I'm a president of. It's very important that we move forward and that also we include the south of the arena, along with that study, just like what the councilwoman has just suggested. And really, we need to be included into this whole process. And I really encourage you to be able to really postpone, perhaps, to make sure that we are included in that process. Because really, we just can't wait five or 10 years from now to be able to be included into that whole process. For instance, Thursday, we have organization that's actually hosting a whole event at George Washington Carver Museum and Cultural Center to feed 400 families that has been pre-identified to show up. That's a lot of movement. That's a lot of traffic. Lack of connectivity around that. So really, making sure that we are included and the south of the arena is a part of the study is very important. Thank you so much for the Thank time. Thank you very much, uh, Prince, and your leadership at the Carver Museum. Very much appreciated. Bentley Calvary is next. Mayor. Please. I have to leave to go to a meeting, and I know this has come through the subcommittee, and I have no qualms about having it either postponed or include some type of additional language that would uh, address this need. Thank you, you very much, uh, uh, Councilman. You have to sneak out of here. Pl thank you for your uh, being here. Bentley, please. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council, if I may, I'd like to cede my time to David Calverly. You may. David, that means you have up to four minutes, but you don't have to take all four minutes if you'd like. Well, as a uh, practicing lawyer, it's very difficult to uh, not take all the time that's allocated. Um, Bentley uh, is my wife. Uh, she's also the uh, president of Bentley Gallery, and together we own uh, Bentley Projects. Uh, the way we understand the uh, plan that is uh, presently on the table, uh, nothing significant will happen in the warehouse district uh, for possibly the next 10 years. Um, earlier drafts uh, indicated the traffic, uh, the traffic plan in our area would be addressed within zero to five year period. Um, I really urge you not to lock our district out of these considerations for another 10 years. I think that the purpose of the ordinance and the intent behind it is admirable. The problem I have is the scope and the timing. But once again, it feels like the city has turned its back on the area south of the tracks. We are not being considered um, as part of the overall continuity plan that is necessary for our area to begin to develop. Um, it was mentioned that the ASU uh, group has 
actually prepared a reactivation study for the warehouse district. This document is in draft form. It should be finalized in the next few weeks by uh, Professor uh, Lauren Alsop. Uh, there are a number of recommendations in there that address uh, the connectivity, the streets, the walkable streets, and it's really focused on making the warehouse district an economically viable part of the city, something that has not happened before and something that we believe is on the cusp of happening not 10 years from now, but right now with ASU beginning to show interest in that area in Michael Levine's building, with other things that are going on in the area, we believe that we cannot wait for the time periods that are in this plan. So we would uh, oppose the plan simply for that reason. But the methodology, the intent, is exactly what needs to be done. Just the timing we would uh, argue with. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, David and Bentley, for being here. Any questions for uh, the Calvaries? Okay. Thank you very much. Suzanne Feaster, do you want to provide testimony on uh, this item? Is she still here? She was in favor of the uh, overall proposal. Uh, Ralph Marchetta from uh, representing Phoenix Suns or the Suns management of the arena. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Mayor and Council. My name is Ralph Marchetta. I am uh, general manager of U.S. Airways Center. I have been there since 1992, then America West Arena, and before that, uh, Arizona Veterans Memorial Coliseum. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate and, and thank staff on, uh, thank staff for all of their hard work on, on putting this study together. Um, we are supportive of, of the plan as amended, uh, but additionally, we would uh, support uh, looking at the timeline in the context of a connectivity committee that would really look at all of the issues uh, around our venue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And by the way, I think it is incredibly generous. I think we, we want to get this warehouse district planning right, and we want to make sure that we do it in a way that allows your building to be as successful as possible. And I think everyone is coming together with good faith intentions to make that happen. We are all in this together. And I Thank think you. Yeah, Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank and much, elephant Mayor. traffic on Jackson Street is a, a big issue for me as well. <laughs> oh, <and> Mayor, <laughs> Mayor, yeah, Mayor, just please. a question if I could of them. Mayor. Please, go ahead. Uh, with this connectivity committee that's going to be created, I assume that you're going to be a member of it and it's going to be equally distributed within the downtown community as well. Is that what we're looking at? It's not going to be weighed one way or the other, or it's just going to have equal distribution and representation across the board. Is that what we're looking at? Oh, oh Mr. Oh. Well, I think I have, uh, we have Billy Mayor. Shields who submitted a card, but not for speaking. But if you want to come forward, now's the time. Jump in. Sorry. Council Billy Shields, uh, 7201 North Central. Uh, as a representative of the Lures, the, the Suns, uh, and a member of Authenticity Council, thank, thank you, you, Mayor and Kate, for getting it together. Look, this thing is going to work. The, the, everybody hasn't been talking. That's been the problem. So your idea is a good one. It's already working. The Suns um, and the Diamondbacks, uh, Tom you. Dorn is here. He can speak for them. Uh, but um, uh, there, I was told that they were on board with. Look, there are issues that we can work on today if we're all talking. There are things somebody sees that somebody else doesn't see. This plan is wonderful. My hat's off to staff, um, but they had a lot to do in a short period of time. We're talking about micro connections here, and so uh, it, it, it deserves a, a deeper look by all the parties affected. And so, thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Billy, for, uh, for that comment. Council, yeah, please go ahead. My, my, I just want to make sure, uh, Mr. Shields, that this committee that's going to be created is going to have good representation from all parts and that not one group or one entity is going to have be dominating it. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, perfect. That's what I care about. Thank you very much, Councilman. All right, so uh, Haley Tilden Ritter is the next uh, speaker. Once again, thank you guys for, for your patience and discussing all these, all these tiny little wonderful aspects. Um, I, I like to say thank you very much for the opportunity to be in the ad hoc committee for um, the development of this plan so far. Um, I feel like I'm here representing representing people with with hidden disabilities. I have seizures all day, every day. Um, my epilepsy prevents me from driving, which means that I need safe, effective ways to get around the whole city. I've done so for 20 years uh, without a car. In, in Phoenix, in the heat, in the 
and, and I'm still here. I, 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 I'm not quite sure why, but <laughs> I'm enjoying it. It's, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful city, and I look forward to seeing all these great things unfold as we put our heads together and, and start making plans. And I'd like to be involved with the process and, and provide input for folks with disabilities. And um, thank you again for the opportunity to be involved as much as I have been so far. So keep up the good work. It's, it's moving forward slowly but surely, but you know, keep, keep up the good work, everyone. Thank you, Haley, very much. Thank Thanks you. for coming down. Thanks for your service. Sylvia Barutia, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Sylvia, did you just provide testimony? She had to leave. She was in favor of the uh, proposal. Eric Emmert, representing the Arizona Diamondbacks. Tom Dorn, representing Di Arizona Diamondbacks. Good to see you. You too. Good afternoon, council members and mayor. Uh, on behalf of the Arizona Diamondbacks, we do support uh, the recommendations of the subcommittee. We look forward to working with all parties involved uh, to meet the, the mutual shared objectives. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any question for Tom, representing the Diamondbacks? Thank you for your support. Thank you. Is David Kreider still here? There he is, David Kreider, DPI. Thank you, uh, Mayor, members of the City Council, uh, Downtown Phoenix, Inc. Uh, this plan is a really big deal for Downtown Phoenix, uh, and we uh, support uh, the staff recommendation uh, and the suggestions of uh, Councilwoman Gallego. It's really going to allow downtown uh, to be more walkable, bikeable, transit, and bu business friendly. And essentially, it allows uh, downtown to function more as a community, connecting all of these unique neighborhoods. Uh, the hard work is obviously going to be moving from the plan to implementation. Uh, we have two really great things going on in the southern part of downtown. Uh, we have a number of really emerging, eclectic, interesting businesses that uh, have developed in the warehouse district. And at the same time, we have these two great venues that generate a lot of event activity. So the idea of having a working group that's going to work on the the transportation issues that are unique to that area is really important. So on, on behalf of the organizations that I represent, I'm going to commit that we're going to work with uh, the neighborhood groups and small business owners, large business owners, large event generators uh, to make sure that the implementation of this plan is effective and works for all of the constituencies. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David Kreider. Uh, I want to get a couple other cards in here. Jim McPherson uh, representing Evans Churchill, Downtown Voices, Sustainable Communities Collaborative. Uh, in favor uh, of the downtown transportation plan. Kathleen Sa uh, Santos, is that, you're not wishing to speak, but not in favor of the uh, proposal. And one more card. I should have done this one earlier. But our friend, former city councilwoman Maria Byer is here. Welcome back to your old stomping grounds. And you did not wish to speak. Do you stand by that statement, or do you want, do you want a chance to relive, relive the glory and come back and speak? I mean, come on. Thanks. Representing the Phoenix Suns, congratulations. <laughs> all right, good to see you. All right, I appreciate it very much. So that's all the cards. Anyone else in the audience wish to speak on the uh, downtown uh, Phoenix Comprehensive Transportation uh, Study and Recommendations. Without that, I'll turn to uh, Councilwoman Gallego for a proposed motion. Thank you, Mayor. This has been an exciting process and will be very important to downtown. It's going to address a lot of safety issues, some issues with confusing roads where we've had downtown business owners report uh, watching cars drive the wrong way down streets, and we're going to be able to address some of those issues and continue the work we started at the beginning of the meeting with creating a more vibrant city, starting with our downtown. So thank you again to staff, and it has been a pleasure to see you at meetings throughout downtown for many, many months. So congratulations. We will, unfortunately, your work is not yet done, but a great first start, and appreciate the folks from our sports teams and the warehouse district coming together to make sure we continue to improve that. So with that, I will um, move approval of the strategies detailed in the Downtown Phoenix Comprehensive Transportation Study with the understanding that stakeholders will meet and study connectivity between the warehouse district and the downtown portions of our city. I'll second that, Mayor. 
All right, so we have a motion, we have a uh, second. I wanna make sure it's clear for the record. So it's to, pro to support staff recommendation, but the, but the portions of it that affect south of downtown in the warehouse will hold off until we have a chance to bring together a, a, a kind of a, a group from both, from both representing both the arena as well as representatives of the warehouse district. And we'll come back, uh, we'll give, let's give it a time period. How much time do you want me to come back before this council and uh, make a decision relative to uh, Third Street? Six months seem reasonable to staff and yeah. stakeholders. So it's status quo until then, obviously no changes until then, but uh, we'll come back and make a recommendation. Uh, and I think with everyone operating in good faith, they're gonna to come to a good, uh, a good plan in that regard. Okay, so that is the, the motion is to support staff uh, with, the, with the exception of south of downtown, we'll come back and within six months on a recommendation on that. We have a second. Any additional comments? Councilman Pastor? Yes. Um, in our subcommittee, we talked about phase one and phase two. In particular, uh, Third Street, Third Avenue, and also Seventh Avenue and Seventh Street. And there was a recommendation before we really uh, go into moving forward and implementing that there would be a study done of how the effects would, how the dynamics would happen. And that was a conversation, I'm having staff pull the minutes right now, but that was a conversation that we had within the subcommittee. And it was my impression that um, it was gonna come back to the subcommittee, but it's here right now. So I just need uh, to understand what the next steps are going to be um, in this process to uh, see how the, um, this is gonna make the dynamic of the traffic flow during this time. Okay, so, so the question really has to do with the proposal that Third, uh, third Avenue and Third and Fifth Avenue become two-way, which are currently one-way, and then Third Street and Fifth Street, which are currently one-way, become two-way, at least in the downtown uh, uh, area. That's recommended under this plan to be done in the, the first five years. So this is in phase one of the plan. And so the question is, uh, the council would, not, would want uh, recommendations or analysis by our staff of what the, what the impacts of that uh, would be. Mayor, may I? Council, please, yeah. I, my understanding was that, that was that we, or my recollection was that we had that discussion about 7th Street. There was originally a lot of feedback from the neighborhood that they'd like to see um, a lane of traffic removed from 7th Street, and that is no longer in the recommendation we're voting on, but that we might continue to work with downtown stakeholders on a study, but that the study would be done before we would make any changes to 7th Street. We might do like a, a short pilot. Is that? Mayor and City Council members, what's important to uh, consider here is that this uh, study is a, a bird's eye view. Uh, it, it's selecting corridors for, uh, for these improvements and what we would have to do is to look at each one of these corridors uh, with um, uh, a, a greater uh, analysis re regarding design and engineering and, and all the int intricacies of each one of them. As a, as a point of interest right now, we are looking forward to uh, putting together an application for funding, which is the first step, a design mag assistance grant for 3rd and 5th Avenue. That's our, our first step really at looking at funding opportunities for these improvements. And, and so uh, the, the study is a, an overall view and we understand that we need to look at each one of these corridors in greater detail. But I want to make sure it's clear that we are, if, we, if this, the vote is in the affirmative, the plan is to move forward with going uh, to uh, both ways on uh, 3rd and 5th Avenues and 3rd and 5th um, uh, uh, Streets. It's not gonna happen tomorrow, um, and we have to come up with funding sources to do it, but that is now where currently the plan is to go one way each way. If this passes, that will be the, the uh, plan. I know the neighborhood around there is gonna be very excited about, uh, about that. That's correct. Other comments, Councilman? Oh, no, okay. oh Councilman Pastor, do you have more? I apologize. Go ahead. Oh, no. So I, my understanding was that this plan th that we're approving here today kept everything one way on 3rd Avenue and I think 5th Avenue, were those the two? Mayor and that, and, uh, that those changes were not gonna occur until later on until we discussed the connectivity and everything else, is that correct? I mean, we're not voting to, to make these one way. Uh, Mayor and, and Councilman, this is- I mean, uh, two way, I'm sorry, two way. 
the, the plan does provide for consideration for those roads that are one way to be two way and further analysis and engineering would have to be looked at and looking at, at what are the, the parameters that we, we would need to do as well as funding opportunities that we're exploring as well. But it doesn't do that. No, I mean, Mayor. it doesn't say this has, you have to come back to the council, is that correct? Ma Mayor, Mayor Councilman DeCicio, voting sure. on this plan would set, path on, set staff on a path to convert 3rd Street and 5th Street, as shown in the map, I believe it's north of Third Washington, Street, mm -hmm. and 3rd Avenue and 5th Avenue, to two-way streets. We have to identify the funding and the engineering studies to do that, but we would be heading steadily in that direction to convert those to two-way streets. So we don't have an analysis on it, though. There's no analysis. We're just going to do it. We would have to have engineering studies to okay. determine well, what it would studies. take to do that, but this sets us on the path to get money to do those engineering studies. Okay. So, uh, Nelson, yeah, please, go ahead. I just want to make sure, because my understanding is that we were not going to vote on that direction today, because I think a lot of the stakeholders were going to get together first and figure it out. Is that was south of downtown. This is north of downtown. Correct. Right. But my understanding, if I could bring up either the Dimebacks or the uh, Suns up here, is this what you guys are agreeing to, that you're okay with the city of Phoenix moving forward with two lanes? So, because it is an so our position right? is that um, we're okay with the plan as approved by the downtown subcommittee, okay, which moved the change um, in 3rd Street south of Washington into the second phase of this from five to ten years. Well, what uh, Councilwoman Gallego today's motion added to that a subcommittee to look at ways to improve connectivity even faster. And maybe, the, look, staff didn't have time to look at the micro pieces of this. There are a lot of ways to improve possibly connectivity between the warehouse district and downtown. And so that's what the stakeholders would get together with city staff and make recommendations on. That's my understanding. Of but I think, I think that was focused in on um, the area south of downtown. Yes. What we're talking about is 3rd and 5th Avenue north, north. of downtown, 3rd and 5th Street north yep. of downtown, uh, Councilwoman Gallego's recommendation didn't make any changes to that. And so if we were to vote here today, that would set the path uh, moving forward. By the way, it, this plan also affects the current sunburst plan uh, for, th for the post-game operations of the Suns and Diamondbacks, and the Suns that were in consultation with the Suns and Diamondbacks, an additional, uh, uh, there's gonna be a lane of traffic that will currently would not allow people to kind of access the downtown businesses that will now be allowed to access downtown businesses. And I think that's a great partnership thing that the Suns and Diamondbacks have ag agreed to be more supportive of uh, the downtown, particularly locally owned uh, businesses in that, in that so regard. Just to follow up, just course. for clarity here, this says it's five to 10 years, so it probably it'll never happen anyways. But <laughs> I mean, it doesn't take five, 10 years to do anything. But at the end of the day, this sets in place a, some sort of plan or direction that the city is going to be moving toward to create the two lanes without knowing what the impact is. So that's what this vote is about. We don't know, there is no study completed yet to say that that is the beneficial thing and we're going to vote on it anyways. I guess that's staff and I want to keep them up here. I want to make sure I have clarity on this. Perfectly fine. Is that correct? So, uh, yeah, uh, maybe city manager or Milton, either one, but uh, what does, based upon what was done, it's subcommittee, uh, and then today, assuming it's an affirmative vote, what would it do relative to uh, 3rd and 5th uh, Avenue and Street? Mayor, council members, if staff will begin seeking funding to do the engineering studies to convert 3rd and 5th Ave and 3rd and 5th Street to two-way, the studies would determine what it would take to do those. But there's no study saying that that's the right thing to do then. I mean, isn't that part of the study to determine whether or not we should be doing this? Mr. Dovalina. Mayor and Councilman DeCicio, just to uh, make sure that um, the study was in consultation and working with Maricopa Association of Governments, where we used a uh, traffic transportation modeling uh, that looked at how we were converting and looking at the future for those corridors. So certainly we did have a transportation, uh, transportation modeling effort to identify what would happen if we change these, uh, these corridors from one way to two way? So that was done. Uh, what uh, the next focus would be is to identify what are the engineering requirements for those corridors to be converted from one way to two way and drilling down more on the details of that. So what so you have here is city professional staff recommending 
that third and fifth avenues and streets can be uh, feasibly and productively converted to two-way streets, what would have to happen next is the details of how you do that, what it would cost, how you get traffic signals and street profile and everything worked so out. To the profession, what does it do to the Suns? What does it do to the Phoenix Suns when they've got you know 19,000 people there? What does it do to them? I apologize. I don't. Th I don't think it affects the Sunburst plan north of uh, of downtown. But, right. but Ralph, you want to please jump? Please jump in. Yeah. It was. It was my understanding that that uh, south of Washington, as the plan currently stands, would continue to remain one way southbound. That's correct. And what we're okay. saying is, from our perspective, in the context of a connectivity committee that would look at really all of the broader issues around the venue, that that timeline could be looked so at. So south <laughs> does not get impacted. I want to make sure that's clear. Right. Is that correct? Okay. Currently, yeah. Correct. Cur well, sorry. currently means, I mean, we're, we're going to wait for some sort of plan to come back. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, when I hear the word currently, that means, yeah, we're going to do it later. We don't know if we're going to do it yeah. later. Council, I think the, the request from the uh, ownership group, the uh, a stakeholder group that's been formed in the warehouse district, uh, their general request is don't make a decision now that is set that that doesn't allow them to maximize the economic activity in the, the warehouse district let's make sure we're considering the warehouse district not as it exists now but as it is moving towards now that we have web pt bringing hundreds of employees te tech employees high wage employees to the warehouse district now that we have great businesses like the deuce and others like we have with uh, bentley uh, galleries make sure we don't do something uh that sets us on a path that we'll make any changes for for years from now when in the future to support those businesses uh, and and uh, restaurants and retail that are going that area, um, we want to we want to do as much as we can to be supportive uh, of them. And so we just want to make sure that we think about that before we lay down the the policy of the city. And that's why uh, they asked David. You have a question? Uh, well, that, Mary, I'm not, I still have the floor. I do I want to finish. Let me, let, go, let me ask, ask David to make any comments he have on that, and I'll come back well, to you, Councilman. Please go ahead. Uh, why yeah, do you Mr. Keep Mayor, cutting me off, Mayor? You keep cutting me off. You've done it three times today. That's very disrespectful. Council, with all due respect. Um, I, I really would you, appreciate it. Just let me finish up the conversation. Let me, let me ask David to make the point, and I would say politely that uh, you, you get more time by far than any other. Well, I, I'm and, allowed to have a debate. And you'll, and you'll continue. And so do you, Mayor. And you'll we continue all to do, do so. David, But, Mayor, go I'm going to ask respectfully if you would just be respectful of my time as well and quit cutting me off and answering questions of staff. Let me I'm ask just asking question. as a favor. I, David, David, a, a member of the public has come. He I wanted to make a point. I know, but I Mayor think he Winston, wanted to, I think he to make a floor, point. floor, which I have the floor. You can't just take it away from me Councilman, until I'm I give, give it, it up. As I always do, well, so you're going to get the floor in just a moment. Please, Councilman, or David, please, right, any comments. I'm going to let you have your way on this, Mayor, but I'm just asking respectfully in the future to quit cutting me off. You tried doing, you've done it to me in the past, and I'm finding it very disrespectful. Councilman, Thank you, Mayor. Uh, you get more time than anyone right, else by far. It's not even about the time, Mayor. Yes. It's the fact that you're being no disrespectful. No one's trying to cut you off. Councilman, no one's trying to cut you off. You shouldn't be disrespectful or argumentative, Mayor. Council, no one's trying to cut you off. Please, David. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council members, um, I just wanted to ask for a clarification of some of the terminology that's been used in the last couple of minutes because um, the term connectivity has been used, but it seems to be isolated and divorced from the street direction issues. And I want to make sure that when we talk about connectivity, this direction issue and traffic flow issue is part of that uh, debate and discussion that Councilwoman Gallego's uh, amendment to the uh, motion covers. And I don't want it to be uh, locked into connectivity, something other than traffic. It has to be all inclusive. And just a clarification. I think that's the intent of the motion maker. Yeah. Please. Okay. Excellent point. Now Council may I finish? Please. I just want to make sure then we're talking north. We're going to be putting in set place a plan that's going to be looking at how we're going to do this and develop it and come up with whether or not it works. South, nothing's going to occur to the south until we figure out what we want to have done there. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so just want to make sure because if you look at it, the way our two largest economic engines in downtown Phoenix work is that they have to unload and put people on the streets immediately and we want to encourage them to stay in the downtown area. So everything that we do must be geared toward that and working with other groups as well. The other concern that I've got, and the city does it all the time when you're talking five to ten years, 
I mean, that's a big gap in there. It could take five, could take 10 years. That tells me that there's a lack of seriousness in this plan and direction that we're going in. You know, usually when you want to get something done, and I've seen this happen at the city, it usually gets done right away. So what you're seeing here in the public, that five to 10 years, a lot of things change in five to 10 years. So I'm taking it with a grain of salt. When we talk about these huge plans that we want to get done when we plan them five to 10 years, you know, especially when you're talking about changing something from a one-way to a two-way, shouldn't be that complicated. Thank you, Mayor. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, to be clear, the, the, the changes that we're talking about at this moment relative to 3rd Avenue, 3rd Street, uh, excuse me, 3rd Avenue, 5th Avenue, 3rd Street, 5th Street, uh, they're in the first phase of this, which is zero to, uh, uh, to five years. Uh, there are other proposed changes that are in phase two, six to 10 years, and then there are other proposed longer term changes that have to do, frankly, with things, some of the light rail changes. And the, since there are gonna be so many additional light rail cars that are coming downtown, they wanted to create more of a, a pedestrian feel in the heart of the city because it'll be so difficult for vehicular traffic to interact with as many light rail cars that are coming downtown as possible. So those, those proposed changes are in phase three uh, what's being um, uh, of what's being discussed. Any other uh, comments or questions? We do have a motion that's been on the table. We have a second. Councilman, please. Okay, here's my concern. How far north are you going? Because my concern is Willow. So are we stopping at McDowell or are we going north? Mayor and, and Councilwoman Pastor, when we started the study, uh, the, the focus that we had was the area bounded by McDowell on the north, okay. 7th to 7th, and south to Buckeye. There was always an intention to look at potentially going north, but we had to formalize a, a boundary, so we looked at that as a boundary right now. Okay. All right. That's what I... So this action is only McDowell South. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other additional comments or questions? My, Councilman Nowakowski? Uh, Mayor, I just want to be very clear that last week we talked about the parking meters, and we left out a big stakeholder, which is ASU, 12,000 students. I'm just, I just want to make sure, because I represent everything west of 3rd Street. And I wanna make sure that all of our stakeholders are actually involved in this conversation. A couple of our stakeholders, or one of the largest stakeholders within that was the Suns, and they, they came to our office saying, hey, we have some concerns. Ray, your staff met with them. You guys fixed it. You came out with this new proposal. It worked out great. I'm just afraid that in the near future, somebody's gonna say, hey, time out. We just missed out the whole ASU students again, or we missed out this community. I believe that the majority of the individuals in the neighborhoods are gonna love it, because we're gonna have that cut through traffic not cutting through anymore, and it's gonna be a two-way um, street. But that's my point of view. I really need to listen, and I wanna make sure that you reached out and you met with these communities. And I'm not on that subcommittee, so I'm not really sure if, you, what the details were. So I'm not sure if you met with those communities from 7th Avenue all the way to 3rd Street and all those stakeholders and if there was anyone who was left out or not. Are you wanna discuss uh, community outreach on this one? Uh, Mayor and uh, Councilman Nowakowski, we had a, a very broad outreach effort. It was three tiered. We start with focus groups with downtown stakeholders and various interests. We went to open houses and also held numerous uh, meetings with, um, as you were talking about, residential areas, Garfield, um, the Evans Churchill, Roosevelt, the Downtown Voices. So we, we re got some good in input from them on the plan. We also met um, a few times with ASU, the planning staff, and worked through some differences in the plan, and they have a letter of endorsement uh, for the plan, um, the ASU planning staff and executives um, that we've met with from the downtown uh, campus as well as Tempe. So I think we had a well-rounded effort from the downtown business stakeholders as well as outreach um, with the residential areas in the study area. Amir, I second this, so I'm, I'm, I'm very supportive. Thank you. I just wanna make sure that we kept on throwing out the word recommendation, we kept on talking about can be, um, if we find the finding, funding behind it. So if there is a group of individuals that weren't heard from or stakeholders that feel very strong about changing it, there's still time to change or we can actually modify it if we needed to, right? Mayor and Councilman, yes, yes, sir. All right, 
That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councilman. All right, we have a motion. We have a second. Is Councilman Valenzuela on the phone? Councilman? Yes, Mayor, I'm here. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to do a, a roll call vote on Councilwoman Gallego's motion. Roll call. Councilman DeCicio? Yes. Councilman Gallego? Yes. Councilman Gates? Yes. Councilman Nolkowski? Yes. Councilman Pestor? Yes. Councilman Valenzuela? Yes. Vice Mayor Waring? Yes. Councilman Williams? Mayor Stanton? Yes, so that item passes uh, unanimously. Thanks everyone who came down to uh, uh, testify and all the people who worked so hard to make this plan a reality. Uh, I know some people have meetings to go to and I wanna be respectful of the time, so those items took a little bit longer, so we'll hold the reimagine uh, item till a future uh, policy session. So I think we've covered all the business for today's meeting. This meeting is adjourned.